but it's funny, you know, <clears throat> this identity politics, political correctness, it's supposedly about being more polite, accepting, kinder, supposedly, because I actually think it's more a power game, but supposedly it's about being nicer. So how wild that the most woke Oscar ceremony ever was also the most violent and hate-filled. It started with this joke by comedian Chris Rock about the wife of actor Will Smith and her apparent buzz-cut hairstyle. She's actually got a medical condition. Will Smith did not react well. Jada, I love you. G.I. Jane 2, can't wait to see it. All right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, that, was a, that was a nice one. Okay. I'm out here. Uh oh, Richard. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. Will Smith just smacked the shit out of me. You took my name out your mouth. Wow, dude. Yes. It was a G.I. Jane jump. Keep my wife's name out your f mouth! I'm going to, okay? The most woke Oscars and the most violent. And thank God they can't pin any of this on an old white male. But it wasn't all bad for Smith. He actually won the Oscar for Best Male Actor and apologised. Kind of. While well, seeming incredibly to preach love, invoke God, and play the race card, you know, my people. I am overwhelmed by what God is calling on me to do. I'm being called on in my life to love people and to protect people. I want to be a vessel for love. I want to be an ambassador of that kind of love and care and concern. Um, I want to apologize to the Academy. I want to apologize to my, all my fellow nominees. But no apology from this vessel of love to Chris Rock, the black man he just smacked in the chops. And the audience treated Smith as the victim here, or the hero. I tell you, this woke world is getting wilder and nastier. Just very quickly, Will Smith smacks a black man in the mouth at the, the Oscars for insulting his wife and is treated like a hero. Had it been a white actor, how would this script have gone down? I, th it was, I mean, it, it would have been endless kinds of discussions about uh, uh, the horrors of this. And, it, you know, it's already been infused with identity politics, even though it was two black men who got into this scrap. I think the point I would make is that lots of people are talking about toxic masculinity from Will Smith. The real masculinity on that stage was from Chris Rock, who behaved so stoically and so calmly and didn't let it get to him Absolutely. and carried on with the show. And that's Good the kind point, of values Brandon. we should celebrate. You know, I can actually understand why Russia and China too thought the West would be a pushover. Chinese academics write about this all the time, how we're tearing ourselves apart with our race politics and our gender wars too, our childish, self-obsessed, tribalist obsession with our identity. Well, today, Oscar ceremony, Hollywood's biggest night, all that rubbish was on full display. Three female hosts whinging still about men, and then each announcing that they represented their race, or in the case of Wanda Sykes, their sexual preference, she's gay. But also this twist, you know, proud to be black, proud to be gay, but ashamed to be white. This year, the Academy hired three women to host because it's cheaper than hiring one man. <laughs> representing black women who are standing proud. Yes, and I'm and living out loud. Yes. 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 And I am representing unbearable white women who call the cops when you get a little too loud. Yeah. Okay. 
But you just look at the new woke rules for Oscar winners, by the way, that are set to come in in two years. For instance, if the cast and crew of your movie isn't 30% black, gay or disabled, you'll be disqualified from the Oscars. And let's say, you know, one of the main characters is black or gay or some other oppressed minority, or your whole story is about them or about women. Doesn't matter if you're filming Shakespeare's King Henry V or a film about Van Gogh. I mean, where are the blacks? Where, where are the gays? Why aren't more actors in wheelchairs? It's so insane. But the trouble is, this is it's not just limited to Hollywood. This ludicrous identity politics is poisoning our own arts scene as well. Just look at the latest arts grants handed out by the Australia Council. Our top arts funding body handing out your money to artists it thinks should get an income even if some can't find an audience to feed them. And all the same themes regularly appear. You know that manic obsession, onanistic, look it up, this onanistic obsession with gender, race and sexuality, what's in your pants. And of course the tearing at this society that gives them freedom, safety and free money. Just three examples of this free money from the latest round of grants. There's $50,000 going to a performance artist, Harriet Gillies, whose website explains her most recent show like this. Expect a TED Talk on acid, a performative lecture on mushrooms, storytelling whilst popping names. It will probably definitive, definitely end with Harriet getting naked and putting something up her butt. But like, you know, in a really arty and compelling way. Even the first show I did here before The Flying Nun had started, we smashed 35 watermelons on the floor. And then there's $33,000 to artist Abdul Abdullah, who identifies loudly as Muslim, who lashes out to that big favourite of the left, Australia's supposedly monstrous racism problem. I'm a seventh generation Australian directly descended from a convict who arrived here in 1815. His name was Charles Blinman and he had a son called Charles and he had a son called Charles and he had a son called Charles and he had a son called Percival and he had my father and my father changed his name to Ibrahim and he had three boys all called Abdul. I'm building a collection of nationalist memorabilia. What's interesting for me is where it goes from straight like, national pride, like things that you have on Australia Day, to nationalism and straight up fascism. Oh, can't have that Australian flag. Another $19,000 goes to an artist called E.O. Gill, who already got $30,000 from the New South Wales government. As a gender non-binary artist who explores this identity policy is proving for him, or I should say they, they prefer they, it finds all this quite rewarding in terms of grants. And after all, without taxpayer funding, where would this identity politics be? Now, if you think all this is a joke, let me remind you, you're paying for all this, even if 99.9% .9 of you would never go and see it yourself. It's uh, the best budget, I think, uh, given the circumstances, but the circumstances are everything. It's a budget delivered, less than two months before an election. And that sort of ties the government's hands. I mean, it's going to give the sort of handouts you've been talking about. You're not going to get the structural reform we need. And I think this is the problem with a, a budget so close to an election. There's only so much you can expect a government to do. Long-term reform is not one of them, not that close to an election. So, mm. you know, I think uh, some of the things in it are, are, are good. I, I want to pick up on one thing in particular. You mentioned unemployment. And I think this is huge, right? I think we're going to get unemployment with three, three in front of us, under 4%. Or I don't know what, we haven't seen this for 50 years. If we uh, get there, it's already at 4%. It's going to go lower. We haven't seen that in 50 years. I think that is a moral good. It's a social good. Getting people into jobs, uh, getting them thinking, I've got control of my own destiny. I've got control of my own money. I can hope I've got a, a stake in the uh, country. And of course, uh, you know, Idle hands, you, they cause mischief. People now busy. I think all this is fantastic. But think of this, Paul. The reason for that is that we got the pandemic. And the pandemic made us shut the border to this insane level of immigration. I would have liked to see, have seen the government say, well, look, that proves perhaps that the good thing about 
close, you know, limiting immigration is that people's people are more likely to find work here and wages will rise, as the budget suggests, because there's a fierce competition for their labour. And let's let's not go back to this mass immigration days of madness, you know, this Ponzi scheme. Instead, the budget says, ah, give us two years, we'll be back to 235,000 people a year coming in net. I think that's a missed opportunity. Now, some Australians are already feeling the Chinese dictatorship's menace. Australian journalist Cheng Lei, she's now been in a Chinese jail for 19 months. She worked with Chinese state television, was quite well known and was very careful. But now she's been charged we think we're giving away Chinese state secrets. So that's the assumption, because today when Chang Lei was finally put on trial, the Australian ambassador was locked out, was banned from seeing what was going on. We have no information about the charges or allegations against the Australian. And no, we just don't have any information on that. And that, that, is, that is part of the reason why we're so concerned, because we have no uh, basis on which to um, to understand why she's been detained. Someone campaigning for Chang Lei's freedom is a former colleague of hers back when they both worked in China. It's Annalisa Nielsen, who's now Sky News US correspondent, and she joins me now. Annalisa Nielsen, thank you so much for joining me. Are we any closer to knowing what it is that uh, Chang Lei has actually done that has caused the Chinese government to throw her in jail? It would have been the best opportunity if they'd allowed the ambassador to observe this trial today. And it's a really strong sign that we will potentially never know. If they're not telling the Australian representatives on the basis of national security what she's been accused of, there is every chance they're saying the exact same thing to Chung Lei because they can do that in the Chinese system. And that wouldn't stop them from then saying to her that she needs to plead guilty as well. Don't forget, this is a court system that has a 99% conviction rate. You don't go into that court system without coming out guilty of something. Where they have leniency is in the sentence you get. This is the really big fear that we won't know. We won't know her sentence and that she might not know it. She might just be filing out years in arbitrary detention. Intelligence intercepted by the US is Putin complaining. Why didn't my generals tell me the bad news? I had to laugh because if Putin watched this show, almost any show in the West for the past month, he'd have seen just how badly his Russian invasion was going. The tanks and helicopters being blown up, the seven generals killed, the frostbite even. But Putin, this former spy boss, didn't know all this, we're told. His generals are too scared to tell him the truth. But I've got to ask what Putin expects when he has his political opponents poisoned or shot when he has banned protests and banned his media from saying bad things about his army or his war. And now Putin's complaining, why won't people tell me the truth? You're the one who chose to be a dictator, you stinking hypocrite. But just because Putin's war is going terribly, we can't relax. We can't stop backing Ukraine even more. Because Russia says it's still planning to take over the far east and southeast of Ukraine with its massive gas deposits and ports on the Black Sea. And while his war continues, well, Putin is turning cities like Mariupol into ruins and killing or driving out so many Ukrainians. And that's why Ukraine's heroic president, Vladimir Zelensky, an hour ago gave a video address to our parliament warning that this really was our war as well. Whatever is happening in our region because of the Russian aggression, what is destroying the lives of people, has become a real threat to your country and to your people as well. There is no only way of bringing the global security as bringing Russia to peace and silence. And Zelensky asked us for even more military help, like our brilliant Bushmasters built in Bendigo. You have very good armed personal uh, vehicles, Bushmaster, that could help Ukraine substantially and other pieces of equipment that could uh, strengthen our position in terms of armament. If you would have an opportunity to share this with us, we would be very grateful. Now, the reason I think this war for Ukraine is a, a war for us too 
is because Russia is backed by China. And this war started just a couple of weeks after Putin and China's dictator signed a joint statement pledging mutual support. Now, for us in Australia, this new axis of authoritarians is a massive threat. I'll give you just one example. China right now is building a network of ports that could soon be used by its navy to cut us off from our shipping lanes that bring us, for instance, half our petrol. Now, just this week, in fact, it was inked today, China made a deal with the Solomon Islands, which is in missile range of Sydney and Brisbane. But let's look first to our east and to our north, the naval bases or just ports that China has already built or is developing. In Sri Lanka, China actually owns a whole port. In Djibouti, it has a port that was used just weeks ago for the first time by one of its naval ships, a port China could use to close off the Suez Canal. China is also building a port in Tanzania and in Pakistan and further east is dredging a naval port in Cambodia that China's navy could reportedly use as well. And it has built naval bases in the South China Sea. Now, all these bases could one day be used by China's navy to block Australian shipping lanes to our north and west. That leaves the east. And in the east, we've now got this deal with the Solomon Islands, a draft agreement that doesn't just say that China may make ship visits and stopovers in the Solomon Islands, the possible start of another Chinese naval base. It also says that the relevant forces of China, means military forces, can be used to protect the safety of Chinese personnel and major projects in the Solomons, supposedly with the support of the government. But a bit of graft, of course, could buy that permission overnight. And China's excuse for coming in to defend Chinese people and projects in the Solomons is never far away. Just last year, protesters in the Solomons capital again burned down Chinatown and killed three people. The next time they do that, they could be up against Chinese soldiers, some of which are already in the Solomons training the police. Our neighbourhood is getting very dangerous.